Thank you for coming out tonight. I know uh, you've come for various reasons. Some of you are interested in the topic. Some of you want to bolster your grade. But, uh, <laughs> whatever your reason for being here tonight, I thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin with a few words of appreciation for my colleague, Allison Trikes. I first met Allison. We decided, to, well, I think it was yesterday at lunch, we met about 36 years ago in England at the Tyndale House, and how time flies. Uh, he's been a wonderful colleague. It has been a great privilege to teach with Allison. And let me just say this, I can't think of anyone else in whom I have seen more fully combined Christian commitment and scholarly pursuit than I've seen in the life of Allison Trike. So Allison, uh, it's, it's been my privilege uh, to work with you. Now, I must say, I, I do tonight have a little bit against Allison, somewhat against him. If you were in chapel this morning, he somewhat preempted my paper tonight. And uh, thou shalt not preempt thy colleague's paper, Allison. Uh, let me uh, say a few words of introduction about my lecture. Uh, I should begin by thanking Kevin, my teaching assistant, uh, who tonight uh, is also my driver. <laughs> if you've been here the other two nights, you understand that. That's an in-house joke. Uh, he put my material on PowerPoint, and I want to thank him for that. Uh, my interest in good works began when I was pastoring, and I was preaching through one of Paul's epistles, and I came to one of his many, many exhortations to good works. I preached on that text when I got the idea to do a series on the topic, and later I did a series of sermons on the topic of good works. One thing I realized as I did this series was that there was very little, very little contemporary material on the topic of good works. Uh, only Bart, uh, Karl Bart was well mad devotes some attention to it, but you don't find biblical monographs, uh, you don't find journal articles, uh, I could go on, you just don't find, uh, you don't find theses or other things on the idea of good works. <coughs> and uh, I, I said myself back then, many years ago when I was pastoring, if I ever got a chance, I wanted to write an article on the topic of good works. And uh, that's what I've done and been able to contribute to Allison's best trip. Now my problem tonight is my paper's a little long. It's 28 pages with too many footnotes, and you don't want to listen to me read 28 pages. I realize that. I debated what I should, I, what should I do. I, I could read the 28 pages and not the footnotes, and my wife reminded me that'll still be too long, so I had a better idea I thought I'll read the footnotes and not the text, but <laughs> my wife said that won't work either. And about that time, I was talking to my wife in the family room, and Martha Stewart came on television. And she was cooking up one of her famous recipes, and she was using condensed milk. She told us it's a good thing, condensed milk. And I thought, well, that's what I'll do tonight. I'll do a condensed milk version. Uh, what I want to do is take a series of quotations from my paper and use them as a synopsis of my argument in the paper. So we'll have a series of quotations tonight, not all the material. And uh, I hope by doing that I can lead you through the, uh, the main thrust of my argument. Uh, the basic outline is this. We're going to do a little historical survey. We'll look at the three great Protestant three theologians, uh, Luther, Calvin, and Barth. And then we'll do a brief New Testament survey, all too brief, I realize that. We'll do a little systematic formulation or doctrinal formulation and then try to draw out some postmodern considerations. So uh, if my driver will. Okay, thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Father in heaven. And that's our launching 
have that in Ephesians 2.10. Now, here we come to our introduction. And this is our major... Uh, okay, I have a quote here from Heinrich Bullinger. Uh, Bullinger, you may know, one of the great reformers. And he published a book in the 16th century, the title, The Grace of God That Justifies that justifies us for the sake of Christ through faith alone, without good works, while faith, meanwhile, abounds in good works. <laughs> and Bullinger's title pretty well expresses the consensus of the reformers. The reformers. They would have all been in agreement with this, with this, and I'll get my lightsaber out, and we're going to look at the second part, while faith abounds in good works. This is the major thesis, or the thesis of the paper, in neglecting, neglecting this important topic. Protestant theology is failing to follow the example found in the New Testament, the Reformers' works, catechisms, and confessions. This is weakening the church in a critical way at a critical time. To effectively minister in the 21st century with its postmodern interest in pragmatism, we need to restore the theology and practice of good works. And that's my thesis for this evening. Uh, we'll begin with Luther. Now, there's a lot of material in Luther. I have uh, just three pages in my paper. Uh, Luther himself wrote a major work on good works, and his concept of good works would be a great dissertation topic for someone looking for a, a PhD thesis. So we're just going to barely touch on it this evening. Uh, it's well known that Luther argued that faith alone justifies without any works of ours. We, we all know that. Now, Luther's opponents took this and accused Luther of being against good works, which, of course, Luther was not. As I've already mentioned, he wrote a, a book on the topic of works in which he affirmed them. And uh, his, uh, here's some uh, advice he has for pastors. Luther also says, it's difficult to teach that we are justified by faith without works, and yet to require works at the same time. Both topics, faith and works, must be carefully taught and emphasized, but in such a way that they both remain within their limits. Otherwise, if works alone are taught, as happened under the papacy, faith is lost. If faith alone is taught, unspiritual men will immediately suppose that works are not necessary. So Luther insists that as pastors, as Christians, as theologians, we must maintain this balance. We must have faith on one side, balance with works on the other, and not confuse the two. Uh, so let me give you a summary here of Luther's position. Uh, Luther gives good works, biblical content. I, I didn't mention that, but Luther goes through the Bible, through the New Testament, and studies what is the biblical nature of good works. And he contrasts this with the Catholic notion of, of saying the Mass or doing penance or other such things or abstaining from meat on Friday. And Luther tries to build a biblical idea of good works. And he argues they do not justify, but they always accompany saving faith. And this is essentially the Protestant position. It will be modified and fine-tuned. Uh, but this is uh, basically the Protestant position. Now we come to Calvin. Uh, now Calvin uh, is second generation. He built his own theology. He has a much stronger platform than Luther. Uh, Luther, as some of you will know, argues that it's justification by faith, which is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls. And Calvin builds a broader platform than that. Uh, and one thing Calvin does is that he ties justification and regeneration very tightly together. Uh, Luther saw they were related, but Calvin really ties them tightly together. And when it comes to faith and works, uh, Calvin says this. He asserts uh, that Christians dream neither of a faith devoid of good works, nor of a justification that stands without them. The two must be together. However, it is within the bounds of regeneration and experience always accompanying justification that good works find their origin. And then commenting on Ephesians 2.10, and let me, uh, most of you probably know Ephesians 2.10, uh, 
For by grace you saved through faith, and not not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, so that no man can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God predestined we should do. And commenting on that verse, Calvin says this, uh, When he, that is Paul, says we are the work of God, this does not refer to ordinary creation. This applies to none but believers. They are spiritually, spiritually renewed and become new men. Everything in us that is good is the supernatural gift of God. The context explains his meaning, that is Paul's meaning. We are his work, i.e. God's, because we have been created not to every kind of life, but to good works. Now, objectively, Calvin ties good works to the chief end of life, which is bringing glory to God. You know, your catechism, the chief end of man is to glorify God. So objectively, the uh, good works is to bring glory to God. From the subjective side, Calvin sees good works as evidence of adoption and regeneration. All right, let's go next to Karl Barth. The three great Protestant theologians being Luther, Calvin, and Barth. And uh, let's see here. Luther is interested in the question how can I find a gracious God? And Barth is more interested in the question of, of epistemology. How can I know about God? So they're both traveling down different roads, looking for different answers to the questions that they've raised. Uh, Luther looking for God's mercy. Barth looking for questions about epistemology. How can I know about God? But Barth does not ignore the doctrine of justification. He devotes considerable attention to the concept in his dogmatics. And consequently, the 20th century sees a flourishing of theological interest in the doctrine of justification. Uh, all sorts of works are published on the topic by Protestants and by Catholics, by liberals and conservatives. Uh, Hans Kuhn, the great Catholic theologian, uh, publishes a work that's a milestone, very significant. Uh, Bart's own son publishes on the topic, and we can go on and on. Uh, Karl Broughton of Brayton uh, says that the course of theology in the 20th century uh, may be described by the rise and the fall of the interest in the doctrine of justification. Uh, and in Marx, the concept of justification is very much Protestant, it's very much reformed. Uh, let's go on into it. Now, he denies works any role in justification. Uh, but he's not about to throw works out. He's not going to throw works out. His theology is too enriched by Scripture, too informed by Reformation doctrine for that to happen. He discusses, and this is the term he prefers, the praise of works under the topic of sanctification. So good works comes under the heading of sanctification in his dogmatics. Although sanctification and justification are distinguished by Barth, they are indissolubly bound together as two different aspects of the one event of salvation. And uh, you will notice by now that Luther says this, Calvin says this, Barth says this, and we need to remember this. Uh, there's a tendency, especially in many evangelical circles, to separate sanctification and justification, to break them apart. You can have one without the other, and, and that's not good theology. They belong together. They're part of the experience of salvation. And then when it comes to good works, uh, Barth has this great little exhortation, I, I think. He says, as Christians cannot belong to Jesus Christ as their Lord and head to no purpose, good works are obligatory for them. You can't belong to Christ to no purpose. And the purpose of our belonging to Christ is for good works. It is for these that one is elected, called, and empowered by God. And uh, I thought that just a marvelous uh, quotation from Barth. Now, Barth concludes his discussion with two quotations from the Heidelberg Catechism. And in these two quotations, we see Barth's commitment to uh, Reformation theology and to Protestantism. Uh, the first one, uh, the 90, uh, 91st uh, question and answer, he defines, which in the Heidelberg Catechism defines good works, and says though, that good works are those grounded in Scripture rather than the opinion of men. 
And here we find the argument that Luther starts. If we want to know what good works are, we must look to the Bible, not to the traditions of men uh, or anything like that. We look to the Bible. And so Barth confirms that in his conclusion. And in the 86th question and answer, he teaches good works are necessary. Uh, because Christ, having bought us, and this is the, he's quoting the Heidelberg Catechism. Christ, having bought us by his blood, has also renewed us by his Holy Spirit, that we should show ourselves grateful to God for his benefits with our whole lives, and that he, that is God, should be magnified through us, also in order that we may have assurance of our faith from its fruits and win our neighbors to Christ by our godly conversation. Uh, if you remember what Calvin said, you see the influence of Calvin of bleeding through here into Barth's uh, own thinking through the Heidelberg Catechism, uh, especially in the notion of assurance. Uh, so that's an uh, all too brief look at uh, Luther and Calvin and Barth, and now I want to do a little uh, New Testament survey, uh, which in the presence of New Testament scholars is a bit of an embarrassment. I realize that uh, uh, you could do many, many theses on this subject, uh, good works in the Synoptics, or in Matthew, or in Luke, or in John, you could go on and on in the Pauline epistles, uh, but I think for the purpose of constructing a theology, I want to quickly, uh, as I said all too quickly, uh, look at this uh, material, and it's important because the New Testament is the quarry from which Luther and Calvin and Barth mine the biblical material that they use to build their own theology of good works. So we're going to go to that far to just to briefly look at the material uh, that they gleaned from it. Uh, we'll begin with the Gospels. And uh, one finds uh, in the Gospels uh, a wealth of material that affirms good works. And I hardly need to say that. But it is surprising that today that material is not developed. You find all sorts of papers on all sorts of subjects, but this uh, subject is just ignored. Now, uh, if you do find it mentioned, it usually comes in under the discussion of uh, wealth and poverty, and then they'll talk about it as a subtopic, and I know several uh, major works in that area. Uh, but there's a lot of material in the Gospels uh, dealing with good works. For example, uh, Jesus instructs his followers to practice almsgiving, to perform good works, lay up treasures in heaven. Now, you're familiar with that expression from the Bible. It's a Jewish expression, and it means to give to the poor. Uh, and also to be rich towards God. That's another way of talking about good works. To lay a church in heaven, to be rich toward God, is to give to the poor. Uh, I remember when I first discovered that's what treasures in heaven meant. And I don't remember now who I was reading. It might have been A.M. Hunter. But the author had this marvelous illustration of the Jewish mindset. One of Herod the great sons had died, and of course he was very wealthy. And he, or he, was, he hadn't died, he was on his death then. I got ahead of myself, forgive me. And uh, they came to him and they said, what are you going to do with your fortune? You haven't left a will. And he said, oh, he said, I'm taking it with me. And they said, well, you can't take it with you. What do you mean, we, you have to have a will so we know who's getting your fortune. He said, no, he said, I'm taking it with me. I gave it all the way to the poor. <laughs> uh, a little Jewish literal isn't there, but you get the point. To lay up treasures in the heaven is to give to the poor. Several major parables stress that at the final judgment, the righteous will be distinguished from the wicked, not because they've kept the law of Moses, but because they have performed good works, i.e. they fed the hungry and clothed the naked. Now let me touch uh, just briefly here on Matthew. Uh, in Matthew... Uh, the life of the disciple is patterned after that of his rabbi. Uh, we realize Jesus was a great teacher. We realize he had his, his disciples. And the notion of rabbi and disciple in the ancient world, teacher and student, is a little different from, the, from our idea. In our idea of a teacher, you come to the classroom and you learn certain information. Uh, the idea of a rabbi and the disciple in Jesus' day would have been closer to, say, learning to be a carpenter or a tradesperson. Uh, what you did as your rabbi was you wanted to learn to live as your rabbi lived, to pray as your rabbi prayed, to practice spiritual things and piety and good works as your rabbi did it. 
And this is the theme that comes out in Matthew. Uh, just as Jesus' life and preachings, uh, teachings, just as his life and teachings bore witness to God's redemptive activity, so the disciples' good deeds lead others to acknowledge God as God and to yield to him as their heavenly Father. So this is part of Matthew's theme. It's the disciples' lives through their good deeds will bring glory to God and lead others uh, to God. Now, in my paper, I uh, devote some material uh, to Luke's gospel. Uh, wealth and good works is a major theme in Luke. A good illustration of this is the rich fool. Uh, you know him, he gets a great harvest and thinks, I'll keep it, and he dies in the night. Jesus calls him a, a rich fool. And he's a rich fool because he's not rich toward God, i.e., he did not give to the poor. You have the shrewd manager who juggles the books. And Jesus says, here's an example of a worldly person. He says, you should be wise and lay up treasures in heaven. You have Lazarus and the rich man, uh, and the rich man dies, and he's not wealthy toward God. You have the rich young ruler, who also has an opportunity to follow Jesus, but his money hinders him. He does not lay up treasures in heaven. And finally, you have Zacchaeus. And it's only Zacchaeus, the despised tax collector, who gets it right. He receives the kingdom, follows Jesus, and gives half his wealth to the poor. So wealth and good works uh, in Luke is a, a major theme. Uh, we'll leave that now and go on to Paul. Now in Paul's uh, undisputed letters, he speaks of two seemingly irreconcilable things. Justification without works of the law, and judgment according to works. Both of these are affirmed. And I have here the material from Marcus Bark, who of course is Karl Bark's son. So justification without works of the law, and judgment according to works. And if you know a little bit about biblical studies, and that's all I really know is a little bit, but if you do know, this has been a hot topic. And the volumes continue to come off the presses. Every year, they keep talking about this notion in Paul. Uh, justification and good works and justification and works of the law. Uh, and we certainly cannot explore all that. The model I found most satisfying, and probably because I am an evangelical, uh, comes from Robert Gundry and also from C.F.D. Mole. And we have here a little explanation from Gundry. And Gundry argues uh, that Paul makes good works evidential of having received grace through faith. And examples, 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, where he speaks, that is Paul, of the work of faith. Undoubtedly, this is a genitive of origin, your work, which comes from faith. And then Gundry gives a series of other passages where the same notion comes out. Works which are produced by faith, a genitive of origin. Now, if we go to 2 Corinthians and Galatians and Romans, uh, we again find that good works do not save, but they are nonetheless important in Paul's thought. And one of the classic passages here is, uh, comes from Galatians, where Paul defends his gospel against all opponents, uh, and he defends his gospel and his ministry to the Gentiles. And you'll notice that Paul tells the Galatians that James... Peter and John gave him, gave him and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. And then Paul adds, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor. The very thing I was eager to do. And it's very significant that Paul would bring this up at the end of the defense of his gospel. Uh, because he says his gospel is given to him by revelation of God. He defends it. He will not compromise it. He will not budge on it. And then one thing he's willing to add on to the important, the most important thing he has his gospel is the importance of good works. Remember the poor. Uh, and Paul says he's eager to do that. <coughs> uh, now, in the contested Pauline literature, and some of you who've done New Testament know that uh, they debate about uh, some of Paul's literature, whether or not he actually wrote it. Uh, but we come to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, which I quoted when we looked at Calvin. Uh, here Paul establishes what is saved for the purpose of performing good works. Salvation is not by works, but for works. And the purpose element is very clear here in the Greek. Uh, you have a strong word, patoimazo, uh, uh, which is to prepare or determine beforehand or predestined. For by grace you 
saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, so that no man can boast. For we are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus. Uh, we are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus. Now I just realize how great it is Christ Jesus to do good works, which God predestined we should do. A very strong word. Uh, and here again we'll turn to Marcus Bart and let him help us uh, along here. In commenting on Ephesians 2.10 in his great commentary on uh, Paul's epistle, Bart says, Ephesians 2.10 gives basic information to the necessity of good works. In eternity, before the foundation of the world, when God loved his Son and elected the saints in him, he also prepared good works for them. If there's meaning in the term pre-existence at all, then the good works of the saints share in it. Still, among the pre-existent things enumerated in the Talmud, good works are not mentioned. So in Jewish literature, we don't find you, you pre- By the way, predestination comes out in Jewish literature. They talk about it, but they don't talk about predestination and good works. So Marcus Park concludes, thus, Paul attributes to them, i.e. good works, an even higher value than do later Jewish teachers. Uh, now, I realize you can debate about Ephesians. Uh, Marcus Bart defends Paul being the author of it. Andrew Lincoln says essentially the same thing here. Uh, and Lincoln doesn't think Paul wrote it. He thinks the disciple of Paul wrote it. And then Lincoln makes the point that whichever way you go, it's still Pauline theology and it's canonical. And so we have Pauline theology in Ephesians, regardless of how we come about on the authorship of the book. Uh, and as you know, our, our, I think one of our problems with developing a theology of good works is that we feel our Pauline doctrine of justification by faith is threatened by it. Luther didn't seem to feel threatened. As we saw, he managed to keep the two in balance. Justification by faith and good works. Calvin does the same. Bart does the same. And... Allison, I think, mentioned this morning Luther's reference to James, which Luther called that right, straw epistle. He called it an epistle of straw. And the reason Luther did not like James was Luther did, well, Luther saw it as an attack on his understanding of justification by faith, and therefore he questioned whether or not he would want to include James in the canon. Uh, a lot of attention in this century has been devoted to, over well, the last century uh, to James and a fair amount to this, uh, to this relationship between James and Paul. Uh, is there any way they can be reconciled uh, or they, are they really contradicting each other? And I would, if you want to explore this, I would direct you to the article by Peter Davids in the book edited by Richard Longnecker on discipleship. Longnecker, our first lecture here for the series. And one of the papers in that book is devoted uh, to this issue. Uh, here we will notice in James it's important to distinguish between works of the law and good works, or just works. Uh, Paul, and for that matter the Lord Jesus, do not find a place for works of the law, i.e. circumcision, Sabbath rules, dietary regulations, uh, but both do stress the importance of good works. So it's not works of the law that are important, in keeping the Sabbath, dietary regulations. Uh, as I tell my students, that when you read the New Testament, Paul, the Lord Jesus, and the other writers uh, conclude that it's all right to have ham and eggs for breakfast. And uh, in the Jewish mind, of course, that would have been impossible. You have your dietary laws and regulations. Uh, and it's primarily... Uh, David's argued uh, it's primarily charity towards the poor that James is concerned with rather than works of the law. Then David adds, James will not accept any confession of faith without hard evidence of Christian love and action. And in a similar manner, this is what Bart argues, this is what Calvin argues, this is what Luther argues, uh, that the real evidence of new life in Christ is a transformed life that manifests itself in good works. And if you see it that way, in your passage in Ephesians, uh, James and Paul may not be saying the same thing, but they're not that far apart. But Paul's saying the purpose of salvation is good works, and 
James is arguing the evidence of real salvation is good works. Now let me uh, speak for a moment about a doctrinal formulation here. Uh, the church belongs to two ages. Now, a little eschatology here, and uh, maybe I should have had a chart, but uh, the Bible speaks of ages, and there's the age to come when Christ returns, and then Paul and other writers speak of this present evil age in which we now live. And in Paul's mind and the gospel writers, the power of the age to come that will be fully manifest when Christ returns, that power is already present in the midst of this present evil age in the church, through the work of the Spirit. When you're born again, the power of the age to come enters your life. When you're regenerated, uh, you're one of the first fruits of the regeneration of all things. Jesus talks about the regeneration of all things, the renewal of all things that will take place at Christ's return. Now, when you become a Christian, you are regenerated. You partake of the power of the age to come. And so the church belongs to two ages. Uh, the church uh, is the people of the kingdom who, having received the eschatological power of the future age, continue to live in the present evil. We are the people of the future age, living in the midst of the present evil age. And, you know, this is a theory. I realize that's a theological theory, but it needs to grip our lives. It needs to form the way we think about life and what it means to be a Christian. Uh, people should see in the church the reality of what it's going to be like when Christ returns. The power of the present of the future age is manifest in the church, and, and, and that's the intent of the church. Uh, as this is the case, it follows one of the main tasks of the church is to display in this present evil age the life and the fellowship of the age to come. Now that's the ideal for the church. In the midst of this present evil age, we display reality of the age to come. We don't fight about the color of the carpet in the sanctuary or what goes on in the church kitchen. Rather, the love and the fellowship of the people of God and the deeds of the people of God reflect in the midst of our present evil age the power of the age to come. And that, that's such a powerful concept. Uh, I, 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 I must move on, but uh, I, I hope that uh, grips you to some degree. By the way, if eschatology is new to you, I would recommend George Ladd's little book the Gospel of the Kingdom. It's written for the intelligent lay person. Uh, an excellent book, The Gospel of the Kingdom, George Ladd. Now, uh, let me go next to the ministry and works of the church bear witness to the kingdom's arrival. So the ministry and the works of the church bear witness to the kingdom's arrival. Uh, if you know your New Testament, you know that when Jesus began his ministry, when John the Baptist began his ministry, they began with the same message. Repent kingdom of God is at hand. Now the kingdom meaning God's rule. God's rule in the lives of men and women. Repent, meaning you change your mind and your life. A change of mind it leads to a change of action. You should repent and now let God rule in your life. Receive the kingdom of God. Receive the rule of God. Uh, many years ago when I was newly converted, uh, I wound up in, growing up in Oklahoma the city was quite segregated. I wound up with a black pastor down in the black part of the city. And it was a sunny evening. So he had this young honky there. And he decided to make use of me. And, uh, his church was right on a corner, a street corner. And he put me out on the corner uh, with literature for the evening meeting. And he wanted me to invite people into the service. Uh, now, I was belong to a good Southern Baptist church. And you know what Baptist churches are like. And uh, here was a, a black Baptist church, which in many ways was different than my comfortable Southern Baptist church. They had drums and trumpets and all sorts of things. And uh, I stood out there and I invited the people in, and the service was quite lively. The music was very upbeat. And uh, this young pastor got into his sermon. And uh, as many black pastors, he had the gift uh, of an organ. And uh, he was calling on the people. Now, what is, and the following news theology is remarkable, and I want to share his illustration of repentance. He said, now, God calls upon you to repent. And you ask me, what is repentance? I'll tell you what repentance is. He said, you're going north in the middle of the winter, and by and by it gets cold, and you start to shiver. You 
pull your coat around you, you say, my, my, I'm getting cold. But you don't change nothing. You keep going north. And it gets colder and colder. After a while, it starts to snow. But you don't change nothing. You keep going north. You say, my, my, it's getting cold. And I'm getting wetter all the time. After a while, the snow gets pretty deep. And you realize that if you keep going north, you're going to freeze to death. You say to yourself, my, my, I better turn around and go south. You turn around and go south as fast as you can go. Brother, that's repentance. <laughs> <laughs> and I have never found a theologian who could explain it as clearly as that black pastor did. That is repentance. And we repent and we see God rule in our life. And once God begins to rule our life, the ministry and works of the church bear witness to God rule in our lives. We have repented. We now have lived a new life in Christ. Uh, created to do good works, uh, okay, created to do good works, the church is the messianic community in a fallen world. The love, mercy, and justice, which will be fully realized in the age to come, are reflected at the present time in the ministry of the church, a large part of which should be good works. Filled with the Holy Spirit, the church continues the ministry of Christ in the world. Uh, you, you probably know, your, some, most of you, your New Testament well enough to know that Luke introduces Christ's personal ministry, and then the ministry of Christ continues in the book of Acts by the work of the Spirit in the church. Uh, Christ's people are therefore, and here's just a few ideas from the New Testament, zealous for good works, ready for every good work, and devoted to them. That's all from Titus. This may be in small things, a cup of cold water, or in great things, selling possessions to give to the poor. Such activities are expressions of the love of God which inaugurates the kingdom and which unites believers in the fellowship of the church. So this is the ministry of the church, whether it's a glass of cold water or a great thing like Barnabas selling a field and giving the poor. Uh, I have to stop and draw out a little illustration. We had a lovely Christian lady in our last church uh, who about a year ago uh, went to be with Christ, oddly me, and just a delightful Christian. Oddly was in her 30s or 40s when she was converted, and uh, she was converted on the run, and she never slowed down. She was very zealous for the Lord Jesus. I can think of no other way to describe it. He really transformed her life, and she was a wonderful witness. She led many people in our community to faith in Christ. We had a county fair every year, and uh, I always saw this as an opportunity to invite people to the church and, sell, and share the gospel. And if you went to the county fair, there were all kinds of booths. There would be a booth here with Italian food, one with Polish food, a booth selling something, and another booth for some other person, uh, purpose. Well, oddly set up a booth for our church. And uh, I don't know what I think of banner. Uh, my wife might help me here. I think he just said in Jesus' name. And it was the only booth where they weren't selling anything. There was no charge. And you could come, and she had bottles of spring water, and you could come, there was an awning, you could stand in the shade and get a glass of cold water. And she had some Christian literature and some literature from the church, a glass of cold water in Jesus' name. Now, it seems a small thing, but I think, uh, looking at the Gospels, that, that was a beautiful expression of uh, the Christianity in action. As would be taking a plate of cookies to your neighbor's house. Maybe when the mom is sick and the, you're thinking of the kids or taking a meal to somebody sick. These are not insignificant actions in the New Testament. They are works that reflect the kingdom of God's at hand just as, as significant in God's eyes as giving great sums of money. And we need to encourage our people uh, to realize this is part of the practice of Christianity. Uh, Paul argues that gifts of the Spirit, this I, I got from Carl Barton, it was uh, again another great idea from Mark. Uh, Paul argues that gifts of the Spirit will cease in the age to come, but faith, hope, and love will remain. The greatest of these three is love. Love is the eternal activity of the Christian. Uh, Bart argues. Love is the eternal activity of the Christian. It is the future eternal life shining in the present. And I just found that a, 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 a not only beautiful quotation, but a very meaningful now let's uh, go for a few postmodern considerations. Uh, a little comment before we move on. Uh, I get the 
the New York Times on the, the internet, you can get it free. And uh, I probably spent a little too much time reading it from time to time. I sent stuff to my colleagues from the Times. Uh, but it was the day before yesterday, Stanley Fish, who's a well-known scholar, uh, many of you will know of him, now at the uh, University of Illinois in Chicago, who's a big proponent of postmodernism. Uh, he was discussing the issue, uh, postmodernism and its relativism, uh, what does the destruction of the uh, World Trade Center mean about relativism? And he's, most of us see immediately it's an evil act. And uh, some people see this as the end of postmodernism. You can no longer say right and wrong, it's just uh, perspective. And uh, so Stanley Fish is dealing with that. But uh, most of Western culture today is somewhere in the midst probably of a transition from a modern to a postmodern mindset. Uh, the postmodern person being more, far more open to relativism and to pragmatism. The important thing about something is not whether or not it's true, but whether or not it's functional, whether or not it's helpful. Uh, now, with the Enlightenment, and uh, keep that in the background, let me move back here. With the Enlightenment, spirituality and practice, praxis if one prefers, uh, in the theological jargon, uh, are marginalized. Actually, that's a quote from George Lindbeck, and I shaved it down and should have changed the English a little bit, but uh, uh, spirituality and practice have been marginalized. However, and this is the point I want to make, it is these that make religion relevant to the postmodern person who is not so interested in the question, is it true, as she is in, does it work? Or how does that play out in life? She's not looking so much for right answers, as for a caring community of people who can be trusted. Now, if this is true, and many postmodern authors are arguing it is, the question of truth is no longer, and I, I think the question of truth is vitally important, don't misread me, but for many people that will not be so important as the question, uh, does it work? Uh, what does this mean for me? And here I think we have a wonderful opportunity for the church. Uh, we reach out to them, if we practice our Christian faith, they will see how it works and what it means and the significance. And so I think it's vital that we, we need to look again at the whole notion of the practice of the Christian faith. Uh, George Lindbeck and uh, several others, have, including one of the professors who was in London when I was there, E.L. Maskell, have noted that the tendency has been to move away from the practice of the faith. Uh, George Grant, who was uh, head of religious studies at McMaster, uh, well-known Canadian Baptist, and then later chairperson of the philosophy department at Dalhousie. Uh, his complaint about religious studies was that religious studies, he said, focuses on the construction of the text. And his argument was religious studies departments should focus on the practice of the religion. And that's what's getting shortchanged today, the practice of the religion, especially in Christian circles. Uh, in the prestigious series in which Dr. Trite's uh, thesis was published, uh, the Cambridge, what is it, Cambridge New Testament monograph series, Allison, uh, one of the volumes is on Paul's intercessory prayers. And the author makes the point in the introduction that prayer, spirituality, and practice are the stepchildren of the church today. It's these things are simply ignored. And we need to rejuvenate an interest in the practice of the Christian faith. I appreciate that my colleague, Dr. Trice, has written several articles on the idea of prayer. Uh, having pastored uh, two churches that were essentially university churches, many of my parishioners taught at the university or were graduate students, uh, I found those people are very interested in questions about prayer, about the work of the Spirit in our life, about knowing God's will. I'm talking about people who taught philosophy, psychology, uh, physics, and other subjects on the university level. And Lindbeck and many others now are saying we must re rejuvenate the interest uh, in our seminaries in the church on the practice of the faith. Now, sociologist Peter Berger, and here I'm coming back a little bit more uh, academically, observes that people have plausibility structures from which they construct their world and life views. Plausibility structures. Uh, that seems plausible. I have a structure that makes things seem plausible to me, an intellectual structure, the way I see the world, the way I see life, the way I see things. Uh, now, building on this, uh, Dennis Hollinger contends that the transcendent reality of the gospel is mediated, or at least heard and seen, in a social context, i.e. the church. 
It is through the church that people hear the gospel proclaimed and through which they also see it live. So it's the gospel, it's the church through which the gospel is seen and heard. Um, we need to, do, we, we, we're not so bad sometimes about proclaiming it, but we need to work more on how people live it, live out the kingdom. Now the con, uh, let's go on, the content of the church's faith, Hollinger argues, is given to it through Holy Scripture. The content of our faith is given to us through Holy Scripture. The church then embodies that content. This combination, scripture and embodiment, becomes the plausibility structure for the Christian and also a basis for, for engaging the non-Christian. In both proclamation and in the life and in life, the Christian worldview provides a holistic appeal to hearers who will not rely on just one mode of reality confirmation. So in the church, through proclamation through our life, uh, the Christian worldview is presented to those outside the church. Now, bringing down uh, my lecture here to a conclusion, the point we're making is that in the midst of the postmodern era, men and women will, and, and we've said this before, uh, you've heard this heard said in Sunday school lessons and in sermons, but I think it's even more pressing now than it's been in the past. In the midst of the postmodern era, men and women will estimate the worth and truth of Christianity, not just by its arguments and academic methods, which my colleagues and I are often involved in, not just by its arguments and academic methods, but also by the lives of Christians whom they see and know. The importance of those lives reflecting the transforming power of God's new creation cannot be overstated. And then, going back to Ephesians 2.10, uh, Marcus Bart captures it well. Uh, Bart says, Christians are made a shining light to signal the dawn of a new heaven and a new earth. Thus, they are a new creation, not just for their own sake and benefit, but as a first fruits of all creatures. The Christians are not the end of God's ways, but only their beginning. They are an exemplary work of God from which all his works will profit. God's work, in turn, calls for works which they, i.e. Christians, do to God's honor. So, that is basically my thesis. We need a theology of good works to minister efficiently.